Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Choice, Choosing Between Additive and Subtractive Manufacturing Webinar, brought to you by ASME. Thank you for all for joining us. I'm Carlos Gonzalez, Special Projects Manager in Mechanical Engineering Magazine and ASME. I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we get to the topic, let's get to some simple housekeeping items out of the way first. The console you're looking at is completely customizable. Every window you currently see from the slide window to the Q&A panel can be moved, enlarged, or collapsed. So if you want to change the look and feel of your console, go right ahead. If you have a question for one of our speakers, please enter in the Q&A widget. We will get to as many as we can during the live Q&A session at the end of the event. If we don't get to your question, you may receive an email response. For more information on this topic, make sure to check out the resource modules where you can download re related materials. You can also learn more about upcoming ASME conferences. If you need to leave early for any reason, don't worry. The presentation will be recorded and available for on-demand viewing starting tomorrow. But before you go, please take a minute to give us your thoughts and take our short survey. Your feedback will help us continue to develop programs that are of interest to you. You will find the survey on the menu dock at the bottom of your screen. Now let's get to today's topic and why you are all here. Today's topic is deciding how to choose between additive and subtractive manufacturing. In this webinar, we will cover the strengths and trade-offs between traditional manufacturing and modern industrial metal and plastic 3D printing. The webinar will provide an overview of the most common additive technologies and materials, focusing on how they are used and some best practices on deciding when to use them for your project. Today's speaker is Greg Paulson. Greg Paulson is the Director of Application Engineering at Zometry, an on-demand manufacturing leader. He heads up the application engineering team and handles special case projects that require attention to material selection, design for manufacturing, and technical engineering resources. He plays a vital role in the vetting of new technologies and materials to add to Zometry's manufacturing portfolio. His background is in product development, using rapid prototyping, focusing on various applications of industrial 3D printing, injection molding, and advanced manufacturing. Again, thank you for joining us today. Greg, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Awesome. Hey, Carlos, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be talking about both additive and subtractive manufacturing because my goal for today is to kind of shift your paradigms and put these as tools on the factory floor right beside each other. Uh, there are strengths and trade-offs with every single process. Uh, sometimes additive is uh, seen as you know something that's way above or way specialized, but in a lot of ways it can have use to just speed up your product development cycle. And it has a you know a place where it is at the technology moment right now, and then where it's going to go is a part of my topic as well here. Um, I just want to check uh, that you guys can see the slide so I can get, um, as it gets starting started here. Um, but uh, yeah, my background is in applied additive manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, design for manufacturing. And uh, I've cut my hands a lot on manufactured parts. So, uh, you know, my background is about making sure that uh, for our customers, that what they're choosing for the project is the right direction based off their, where they are their design phase, as well as where um, they intend to go for the ultimate manufacturing process. Um, so we make a ton of parts at Zometry. Uh, we are doing seven different additive manufacturing technologies, as well as CNC machining, turning, uh, EDM, sheet metal, profile cutting. Uh, we do injection molding, urethane casting, so again, our experience is not about like, hey, I have this one machine, let me sell you uh, parts in this machine. It's always about looking in from an agnostic approach and looking at the application first. So today, uh, as Carlos mentioned, my goal is to go over this paradigm that we have right now with traditional manufacturing. And then we're going to review um, these uh, 3D printing processes. Uh, I can't go over them all during this, uh, so I'm gonna take my top picks and go over uh, each one with the strengths and trade-offs, as well as showing some examples uh, with these processes. Um, we're gonna summarize all that, show how, how it fits into a greater manufacturing theme. And then uh, we're gonna go into Q&A. At any time, please feel free to submit a question uh, on the Q&A tab. Uh, I love questions. Uh, we work best with, uh, with this context. So uh, please submit them along the way. 
We'll make sure to get to you or as many as we can. And then afterwards as well, um, I'll be answering anything that we don't get to via email. So let's start off with traditional manufacturing, like this, this paradigm that uh, we have right now. Uh, think about it this way. Like, why do you, when you look at a part, you know, why is it smooth? You know, why is, why are these features in a, for example, like single directions? Uh, why do we think and compare materials by essentially their stock grade, you know, like for example, billet or, or material resins. And this is because up till about two decades ago or so, uh, traditional manufacturing has been the only way to produce a part, especially a part at any level of production. Uh, so when I talk about traditional manufacturing, uh, I'm talking about things like machining components um, or sheet metal fabrication, where I'm taking a bulk material, I'm using their tools to you know, cut, mill, bend, or form these features, and uh, then I am, uh, I'm you know, applying them to my, my end goal. Um, we have auxiliaries of that, like injection molding, where, again, I'm using something like CNC machining. I'm using things like EDM, so it's attractive processes to build these parts. And, uh, and then I'm using that to inject multi in, get my form, and then uh, that comes out, and that's the, my part. So if I even look at injection mode parts, I'm really looking at machined and machine-capable finishes. So everything around us, everything that we're defining right now is under this paradigm of subtractive manufacturing. It's not good or bad. That's just what it is right now. And it'll come into play when I start talking about additive and, and its best applications here. So again, traditional manufacturing, it's been around. It's, you know, it is definitely something that uh, we are very used to. So the things that you see around you is what you're, you're comparing to, but also, I mean, why not, right? It's uh, fantastic material selections are characterized materials. I know that I can order 6061 uh, T6 aluminum almost anywhere in the world and have a basic understanding of about what I'm getting uh, it's machine properties, it's physical properties, like I could simulate that in CAD. And it's something that I'm very used to. This industry has been around so long, I, could, I have custom finishes. I still have mass production scalability, especially when you think about things like molding. I mean, around you right now, probably in your room, is hundreds of injection molded pieces. Uh, this is something that you could go and build parts in the millions, hundreds of millions, and so, and so forth. Uh, it's precise because I'm moving things like an end mill tool closer to this, I'm able to change parameters so I can actually slow down here and just barely shave off some features to get down to thousands of, to of, uh, of an inch of tolerance here. So very tried and true. It's what we know, and it, you know, it's a very powerful tool. Uh, but you know, I, like, I, I have a two-year-old daughter. I like to say I can make one dad joke per presentation here, so this is my dad joke for today. But you know, subtractive, it's what we know. And I have a picture here of a landmass that was actually a seabed at one time. And uh, as it dried out, uh, it, the uh, walls cloud around it. So I have these sharp external features, uh, you know, rounded internal features. I have these tr subtractive manufactured feature sets from this. But if you had the ability to grow a part, so, you know, my, but now, we, now we can make parts grow here. I'm showing something like a reef formation where... Every bit of coral starts off with a similar substrate, like a similar similar base structure. Uh, but the design of the coral is for the purpose in which it's in. So it's you know the exposure to sunlight, the exposure to its food source, the currents, the the tides, the waves, and every single piece of coral, like the macro structure, is unique to its application. And with the ability to uh, to grow parts. A lot, of, uh, a lot of ways to think about this, especially for end-use production with additive manufacturing, is going to be in that application-specific nature. So just understand that these are different ways of approaching a problem where you're approaching from a large structure and then moving, forming, shaping it down to the structure for its purpose, where additive may be starting with a very much smaller structure and building that up. So this is the paradigm that I want to kind of bring you you into and discuss real world examples and real things that we could actually do with uh, additive manufacturing. So 3D printing, uh, I'm going to go by the definition uh, that uh, Terry Ollers has, and uh, I think it's very good. Uh, so, you know, you hear 3D printing, uh, a lot of times we'll talk synonymously with additive manufacturing. Um, 
you know, about a decade ago, we caught a rapid prototyping. Uh, now, uh, 3D printing is probably more more marketing term there, but additive manufacturing is kind of usually phrased for industrial level technologies, but it's not always uh, um, it's not always uh, used that way. But it's uh, something that uh, we usually we're talking more about like industrial equipment there. But you may see freeform fabrica fabrication, layer manufacturing, additive techniques. All these are under the same umbrella where. I'm taking material, uh, whether it's a rigid material, a powder, um, a liquid material, I'm joining it together uh, to, we're using 3D model data. So this is really important for my definition, at least, and uh, building up usually layer upon layer and creating that geometry. I really like this definition because it adds 3D model data to that. So it's, uh, it is actually drawing to the 3D CAD model. Uh, this is very important because when you see something like a 3D printing pen, it's not really a 3D printing pen, in my opinion, unless I have a robotic arm holding my arm and zigzagging back and forth and building this, uh, um, building the part up. It's really just an extruder. So it's really important to understand that a 3D printer is taking this three-dimensional CAD data and doing its best job to interpret that to make a physical model. And that's going to come into play in every technology that I talk about today. So it's another way to make something. Uh, it's just another tool that we have in our tool belt here. So some common themes in additive manufacturing. The printer dictates the tolerances, not the print. So as I mentioned with subtractive, you're used to cutting down from stock. And that allows me to individually affect pull the path and the code in order to actually change that stock shape and size on the fly, in, in, including the ability to kind of stop measure check. Uh, so do things like in process inspections. Uh, when I think about 3D printing, especially when we started talking about the first iterations, you are going to expect the net shape, which is the Printer's best output of that model based off the model information provided. Uh, when I tune a 3D printed part to hit measurements that are required, I'm actually tuning the CAD model. So I'm, I'm typically designing within the tolerances of that process, and each process has its own strengths and trade-offs when it comes to tolerances and feature sizes that, that, that are allowable. I'm doing a print. And usually, if I'm tuning with those tolerances, uh, it, it's you know almost plug and play. But if I do need to tune it to something that's uh, below that, so say sub two thou, sub um, uh, sub three thou, oftentimes I'm going to make a part with my you know best estimate about how that part's going to turn out, print it, measure it, and then possibly do some grooming on that 3D CAD model in order to move up. The beautiful thing, though, about this is that it is highly repeatable. So once I tune the model, I usually um, plug back in and continue into you know low volume, mid volume production with it while getting a repeatable unit. Um, of course, because additive doesn't require setups or tooling, it's powerful for prototyping. Most of the time, what you're paying for when you buy additive manufactured product is just its time on the machine. So it's just basically the real estate that you're renting on that build platform to make that part. Uh, that means that uh, without a large fixed upfront cost, uh, parts can be very economical. And also because the printer doesn't require heavy setups to it, uh, we usually have rapid iterations. Uh, even in a lot of powder bed fusion technologies, uh, usually like a good, good rule of thumb for me is a two to three business day uh, lead time because there's probably already parts running on the machine right now when you order. Um, I'm usually able to set them up for to run the next day. And then I usually have that other day uh, kind of to cool down those parts. So within this within this time period, you're usually having, uh, as a factory, you're usually having parts being made, uh, parts cooling, and then parts being broken out to ship. Uh, and going back to my coral example again, the best use for additive beyond prototyping. So thinking about additive as an end use, part of my product line, and part of my released SKUs, uh, would be something that is purpose designed. So looking for that function, um, you know, uh, 
looking at not necessarily looking at cosmetic side of things, especially on, a, on most additive processes. We'll go into that in, into higher detail here, um, but actually uh, thinking about the purpose, thinking about the function, and taking advantage of the ability of growing the parts versus having to just cut it down to shape and size. Uh, the other thing to note and across additive manufacturing technologies, especially when it comes to scaling, is that uh, size and detail limitations um, still exist uh, per platform. So it's really important to know that if you have a family of goods being made and you look at additive manufacturing technology, especially if you have certain material choices uh, that you're, you're going in a direction of, to know the extents of that platform so that you're uh, just like you would be uh, designing for traditional manufacturing, you're designing for the right process with an, the additive umbrella. So I'm going to be talking about a few top choices today. A uh, um, couple powder bed fusion technologies. Uh, so metal printing I'm going to start off with. So uh, that's often called direct metal laser sintering or selective laser melting. Um, powder bed fusion uh, nylon or polymers. Uh, I'm going to be talking about selective laser sintering, uh, multi-step fusion as well, because they're kind of in that same family there. Uh, probably the most common one if you're used to uh, desktop platforms and even stuff that's you know relatively um, introductory uh, material extrusion, so fused deposition modeling. Uh, I'll be going into that and some of the strengths about that. And then finally, talking about VAT photopolymerization, so talking about things like uh, d uh, digital light synthesis, uh, stereolithography. So let's talk about printing metal here. Um, direct metal printing uh, is, uh, is sometimes, again, called uh, DMLS, uh, SLM, selective laser melting. Sometimes it's direct metal laser melting, DMLM, laser cusing, et cetera. But it's all kind of the same process here. So you should see a little video show up in a, just a second. Um, this is a process where I am essentially strong arming a part to be made. I have an inert build chamber. Uh, and this is a very fine layer of powder, so usually 20 to 40 microns of powder. I then have a laser go and etch into that metal powder, creating a melt, not just of the powder from its neighbor to neighbor. So you can see this is a multi-laser platform, so you see a couple scan patterns going through. Um, but not just uh, neighbor to neighbor, but also at least one layer underneath, because that gives you your third dimension. That gives you your 3D print. Every layer a new layer of powders going across as well as the build bed and moves down. So sequentially you're stacking these etches of geometry on top of each other and fusing them underneath, creating a 3D metal part. Um, DMLS is, uh, is typically uh, you know, very good for things like uh, steels and aluminums, and there's some other precious alloys available. Uh, but kind of the beauty of this is that I am able to build parts with some purpose uh, behind them. So let's just uh, talk about some metals real quick, sorry. Uh, so aluminum, stainless steel, like 74, 316. Uh, tool steel, like margin steel. Uh, titanium and ink are very popular in the industry, uh, aerospace industry. Um, they're also, like, although they're difficult to source, uh, uh, copper alloys, some specialized alloys, like uh, scalp alloy, um, that are specific for the DMLS uh, lines. Uh, and cobalt chrome are also available. But I know at Zometry, we do a ton of aluminum stainless uh, parts. They seem to be the more commoditized versions. So taking advantage of 3D metal, per metal printing is taking advantage of purpose-built designs. Uh, this is more on that extreme here. So this is a topology-optimized design where I'm actually able to say where my fixture points are. So this is where this part will be made into its assembly, uh, these, like, these round holes here. And then I'm going to tell a simulation program to say, these are the physical forces that are going to be affecting these joints. Now create me a geometry and essentially digitally grow a geometry that hits uh, the physical limits that I need to give that, give that strength to the part. So oftentimes you see that more organic shapes kind of form with the topology optimized part. Um, if you're moving into uh, direct metal centering for the first time, you don't need to go that crazy. You could probably just um, think about making a part that's more similar to a die cast design where you're starting to lightweight out uh, features, create, uh, uh, create cavities, uh, um, even if you have some light lattice structure or uh, even you know think uh, something where you're just using ribs instead of solid mass. 
uh, that's a great strength uh, for it. It's just that lightweight design, but uh, um, strength purpose designed in. Uh, I am able to print a one-off or multiple offs at the same time. It, it eliminates tooling. Uh, it's great, you know, I, it's, I can go in and basically create a part with some support structure and press go. If the rev changes, no matter, I could just do this again. The, the machine does not necessarily care if the revision is different. So I can make highly configurable different parts. Um, this is also, you know, a great alternative to casting. Uh, it's a great substitute. Instead of waiting six to eight weeks uh, for parts to be casted, like investment casting or uh, even die casting, um, I could just make the part on demand. Um, this material is fully dense. So it is as dense, if not more dense, than any cast part you're going to make. So you can go direct to end use with this. Uh, and of course, showing this, the complexity is quote unquote free. It's actually cheaper to make a part that looks like this than to make a part that looks solid like a, like a machine part in metal printing. And that's because the more stuff I have to fuse together, the longer it uh, it'll actually take on the machine and actually the more inherent risks you add to the print because of stresses uh so you actually don't want to make a hockey puck on this uh on this platform you want to make something that has much more finesse much more complexity to it but here's my considerations uh this surface finish so if you looked at the uh the part on the previous slide here you kind of see that matte almost kind of an orange peely or sugar cube like finish uh, that's typical with direct metal uh, because I have this laser that's fusing this powder bed, and this laser will actually uh, kind of have a little bit of a of a melt weld splash at the um, on the edges of the part. Uh, so I have a naturally rough to the touch surface, very similar to if you receive a sand casted part. Um, the orientation of the part is also dependent on how I mitigate support structure. So I have, uh, so for example, my support structure is going to be metal tines uh, holding the part together. So I have uh, often cosmetic little bumps that are occurred or like maybe a sl slight grid pattern on features that are supported. So support is basically anywhere that your part will cast a shadow uh, underneath itself it means that there's an overhang there and I'm building a structure to hold it there because uh, I need something to melt onto to basically have that, that feature floating in free space as I'm building the rest of the part around it. And post-processing woes. Um, this slide here is showing two photos. So the first photo is a, um, is a part of like little propellers. And that long extension, that round extension, is going to be cut off ultimately. It's literally a work holding extension. So uh, the person who designed this metal printed part was mindful of the post-processing needs. So they actually added a um, metal or extension so they could grab onto that part for some post-machining. Uh, the other side of that is I, I have a part to the right. So this part had many ports that were milled in. And keep in mind, this material is fully dense. So that milled-in feature on this part is actually, uh, you could see it just looks like I'm cutting the billet. So it's you know, very exciting to see that with metal prints is that, hey, this stuff is like billet. Uh, but if you do a traditional drawing, which was the issue on this, the uh, designer actually put a central datum in the drawing, which is a, basically a reference of where else to put these features on. And by going with one central datum, they weren't uh, keeping in mind the nuances of 3D print, where it has a little bit of an organic shift that happens as the parts tempers and cools um, during the build. And by just basically saying the center is the center and then reference everything off the center here, uh, you, you started to see like a lot more off axis holes. So this part actually got scrapped by a bad drawing where if the drawing was taking a look at each cylinder as its own individual datum and referencing features for that cylinder on, there would be no problem functionally with this part. So sometimes it's just a level of understanding and considerations when designing for a direct metal, especially with post process line. Moving on to if you've done any 3D printing, you may have uh, done uh, something like laser cinching or multi fusion with a bureau because it's cheap and very functional. Uh, again, think that DMLS, I have a um, powder bed of material. So in this case, a white nylon for selective laser cinching and multi fusion. And this is a super fast time lapse here, but kind of showing about, your, I think every layer is about seven seconds. Um, I'm taking a uh, doing a digital scan 
using a CO2 laser and fusing again on my left and right neighbors of this cross section, as well as fusing one layer deep to get that uh, three-dimensional fuse and building uh, over and over. The difference is that with SLS, I'm not strong arming to a build plate like DMLS. I'm actually have a thermally compensated build area. So the build, build area is around 130, 140 Celsius. So the plastic doesn't curl up, it doesn't fold under, just kind of sits there when it gets melted. So think about taking a golf ball, sticking into a, um, a box of flour, and then letting go. It doesn't sink, doesn't, or it doesn't sink, it doesn't float, it just stays there. And so you can do that with SLS parts. So I can build parts with the need for support structure. So I can build parts in bulk with SLS and MJF. In fact, most of our builds are usually somewhere between 30 to 300 parts um, uh, being built in my SLS platforms. I could also do a, um, I could also do things like customize. So, you know, customized fixtures, for example. So say you had uh, 22 different drill fixtures uh, I can do this all in one print because I can do this mass configuration. I can add this uh, um, high level customization without increased cost to it because this is a machine that favors the many. Um, nylon itself is chemical resistant. Uh, you can autoclave it, you can gamma sterilize it, you can ETO it. So it's just a super versatile material. It's scalable. And again, because you're just renting that space in this three dimensional space, so I think like most build platforms, platforms are 13 by 13 by 23 inches. You're just renting that space, and your part's about the size of the fist. So it's it's a, a very very useful platform uh, for, for rapid iterations. Uh, the lower left picture I have on this uh, on the SLS and MJF considerations is multi chip fusion, which has a, essentially a gray scale, kind of a light uh, matted gray look uh, on the print, and that's because it's actually fusing not with a laser, but actually with a almost an inking binder. That gets um, that uh, basically gets heated by a heat bar to create a fusion effect. Uh, the ink itself is black, so if I cut into a multi-step fusion part, it'll be jet black on the inside. Uh, just something a cool little tidbit, especially if you have something that you kind of want to wear down in black versus wearing down white like SLS will. Uh, but yeah, you have a choice of nylon or nylon. Uh, there's not a lot of choice with uh, selective laser sintering. Uh, you you can add some accoutrements like glass fill or dye the parts, uh, but very limited in what, what's available for post-processing as well as what's available for material selections and colors. So general use but may not take you to that 100% mark that you need in production. Um, I love it for internal components on a production side, especially things like holding up a, a printed circuit board, because oftentimes you're revel changing your PCB design and you don't want to change your exterior shell, which may be injected molded. So if, you know, a cool little pro trick is using something like SLS to build an internal bracket. So all you do is to change the config of your bracket, uh, keep on making your parts, be happy with your life. Uh, because it is nylon and it is not, uh, it is not kind of fixtured down by support structure, uh, the larger the part is, the more prone it may be to warp. So I may move you to another uh, process. Uh, if uh, the parts are overly large, I'll go into fuse deposition, which is a great uh, uh, topic for talking about building large parts. And again, like that limited post-processing is probably the biggest crux right now of SLS and MJF is it's so useful, but if you need a part that is you know silky smooth, or if you need a part that is a different color consistently, uh, it could be a real challenge to get there. So we just talked about powder bed. And again, I'm doing that powder bed platform. I'm moving back and forth uh, on that powder bed, scanning with a laser, creating heat or fusing with that binder like multi-jet fusion has. And I'm creating end use functional parts, you know, fully dense on the inside. Uh, and they, you know, are very versatile, um, very versatile. But again, my material choices are much more limited. Uh, you know, SLS, MJF is nylon. Uh, DMLS, I have like a very short list of available materials here. And then you have something like fuse deposition modeling. Uh, so FDM is a 3D printing process that's very different from those powder bed processes where FDM is taking a spool of filament, um, sometimes multiple filaments, and melting it down and kind of zigzagging back and forth to make the shape of your part. Uh, so I have a video of this running. And to kind of explain what you're seeing here, because this is fast and in these industrial machines, it's not as like pretty as seeing some of the uh, desktop machines, because uh, there's a lot going on in these ones. But uh, I have a soluble support structure with white on this part, on the part that's being printed here. 
And I also have the actual part, which is going to be a black, in this case, a black ABS material. Um, so you see the, the parts are actually kind of fused down to a build plate. Uh, so I'm basically building across X, Y, but they're all kind of sitting like the, you know, part on the table there. They're fused down, which means I'm, I'm able to grow larger parts without having to worry about warping. I have that support structure there. But I also have the industrial, like the support structure that's soluble. So I can actually run this more on, at an industrial level where I could just peel off the parts, dump them all into a sodium hydroxide bath, kind of like a big washing machine, and wash off that support structure, take out my parts, uh, dry them out. They're good to ship. Uh, so I have, you know, some, uh, some benefits there. But the beauty of FDM is that I have variety. So because I am selectively melting uh, this filament, I'm basically able to take advantage of many different thermoplastics. Uh, I know Zometry offer uh, uh, different varieties of ABS, ASA, uh, polycarbonate, uh, PPSF, uh, and Altum. And there are you know many options, many color options for this, and it's very much a boutique build. Like I'll set up a build for yellow ASA, and I'll set up a build for translucent orange ABSI. And uh, I'm able to build these parts to a specific material. So sometimes if you have a need to hit a specific material because of the chemical compatibility or a testing nature, FDM may be the best approach to go, as well as these large parts. So you can see my hand here um, holding this large gray part. This part was a one-off. It's the only reason it was needed was this one application in the world. But they needed end-use parts and they can install on a wall and live with forever. So... This part was made out of gray ASA. It's a UV resilient material. They purpose designed this for, for the project. It's got a base and a cap. And, you know, uh, they were able to make this. So it's one-off but non-prototype use. So I'm using real thermoplastic. I have, um, I'm hitting some color needs. I'm hitting a material spec that, uh, that hits the requirements and able to make those parts. But here's the trade-off. I am drawing with a crayon here. I have a... Um, I have a finite size for that filament that's being extruded. So when I extrude this material out, uh, uh, small features like text, um, you can't really see it too much in the image with the white, uh, white panels there, but those panels are about two feet long. I can print up to 36 inches in this platform. Um, so that, that little grid, that vent grid, kind of looks rough. Like everything else about the panels looks, looks pretty decent. You see some coarser layers stepping on the parts, but net geometry is something that will fit into the assembly and and hits the need for a functional test uh, but yeah i have um i sweat the small details i do have coarser steps so on my layers um and because i am doing a boutique build unlike sls where i'm able to stack a bunch of parts into one build uh i'm usually building you know only a few parts at a time for that specific material the specific parts so my scalability is more fdm machines it's not a bigger platform is usually like an army of machines, uh, which is something that we take advantage of with uh, Zometry's manufacturing partner network. So just understand FDM is fantastic for a lot of like specific material needs. Uh, but if you're trying to get something that's like high resolution detail or get something that has a cosmetic smooth surface finish, uh, I may not lean you this direction. I, I may take you to a different uh, technology. And then moving on, so I, we offer uh, different photopolymer processes. Uh, so we have, you just, you just went on this edge of thermoplastics and metals where I have, you know, I'm fusing these metals, or I'm, I'm melting these thermoplastics, creating a, a bond of fusion and building them up. Um, there's other ways to produce parts uh, through essentially photopolymerization. So by taking a liquid photopolymer and curing it with a UV, uh, sometimes a laser, sometimes a UV projection, like uh, through like a DLP projector, um, I could create net geometries uh, that tend to have tend to exhibit that surface finish of the liquid resin. So I have a smoother surface finish. Uh, Zometry just introduced actually in August uh, carbon DLS to our platform as a instant quoting uh, material. And it's new to all of us. It's new to, to most of us here, but it's super exciting in what it's able to do. So carbon DLS grows parts uh, with a continuous process. So it actually, imagine a video of the cross section as the part is being built up and it's curing that part uh, through and through, but because it's continuously moving, I'm also getting 
for what's called isotropic uh, effects, which means that I have um, physical strength that's similar in every direction of the part. Uh, so I don't have a weakness in the Z direction, for example, with this. Uh, but what's unique about the carbon process is that it, it also has a secondary thermal cure to it that will uh, give it end use mechanical properties. So I'm really excited about this. The platform's pretty small, and I'll just go into that. But what I'm excited about is that I'm basically making urethanes uh, with a print, or urethanes are epoxy based materials. Uh, it's a really unique process, and it's something that bridges that gap between smooth surface finish and end use, where a lot of these uh, these processes that I mentioned beforehand may have great end use application, but may not uh, win out on that surface finish requirement. Uh, in this uh, picture here, you can see some images of parts made in uh, uh, made in rigid polyurethane or epoxy materials. Um, Carbon has been introducing more resins. They've taken a niche in the uh, dental marketplace, so you see a lot of dental-specific resins. Uh, but what's really caught my eye is the EPX epoxy, uh, highly chemical-resistant, um, highly impact-resistant, uh, and um, just a very nice, robust end-use material. Uh, the rigid polyurethane, again, is a direct substitute if you're used to doing something like urethane casting. This is getting you that result without needing the tools, so like an end-use result part without needing a um, to make a silicone tool, for example. Um, the elastomers are the only elastomers that I, that I know of that are commercially available like and readily available three, for 3D printing that can take a beating. So the EPU, the elastomeric polyurethane, and the SIL, the silicone urethane, are both extremely robust, resilient uh, materials for making a rubber-like component. Uh, and I can't stress that enough because I've I've personally invested like had to pay like seven hundred dollars to get like a little O ring before just because the only way to make end use O ring uh, in the past had to be uh, urethane casting. So having these advancements in this technology is really you know really useful. So the strengths of this I am building in a urethane based uh, print. Um, I get that smoother surface finish. I get isotropic properties, so I don't need to worry about uh, weakness in the Z. Super important when you think about clips and things that will snap back in place uh, because orientation can be, play a very vital role, especially if you're doing something like FDM uh, where Z-axis is much weaker. And then those elastomers and silicones are super useful. Think building strain reliefs. You know, it's a, uh, something that you can go install and just forget about it. Let, it, let it do its job. Here's the consideration. The technology is relatively new. The footprint is still very small. So, um, most of your parts, if they're if it's below like a four by four by six inch, it may be a good candidate for this. But the ideal size is a size of a part that can scale a little bit more. So can, if I want to build twenty of these pieces on a platform for DLS, you're really thinking about the rule of two fingers here. So like if SL if FDM is kind of like the rule of the forearm, like it's about that size, it's probably great. SLS is the rule of the fist. You know about the size of your fist, it uh, um, you could build a bunch of them. And DLS is about the rule of two fingers, where if it's about the size of two fingers, so that's like one by two by three inch, um, I can fit about 20 on a platform and get a decent economy of scale from it. Uh, just something to consider with it, but understand that as the technology progresses, the build size will as well. And just a reminder, guys, please keep questions coming. We're going to be uh, talking uh, uh, more and getting to the Q&A in uh, about 10 minutes here. Uh, so I covered powder bed, I covered fused deposition. Um, we covered some photopolymers. There's a whole family of photopolymers that I love to death that I just didn't, I, I didn't keep them on this, uh, uh, this webinar just to kind of save on time. I want to talk about more about what's new and, and more relevant. But stereolithography, um, we have 15 SLA materials and that gives you that smooth surface finish, but it just doesn't give you that urethane end use. It's still you know, pretty good though. So if you're used to SLA, uh, we do a lot of SLA prints as well. So. On the horizon, though, and this is what I keep my eye open for. So it, when I made this slide two years ago, Carbon DLS was on this slide. So I hope that they graduate into my routine here. Uh, but yeah, Binder Jetty Metal's back. Binder Jetty Metal's been around for a while. That's a way of metal printing by essentially um, inking a glue binder across a layer of powder and kind of going back and forth layer by layer. And I create a green part. So if I took that part uh, right off the print, and squeeze it, it will just crumble. It will just uh, you know, turn into dust. Um, but if you bring it through a post-sintering process, 
that green state part will actually fuse. It'll shrink down a little bit, but turn into a fused metal part. Uh, and that is very exciting because that it can create very complex geometries and end use materials. What's made Binder Jetty more uh, popular now is HP's got in the game, Desktop Metal's got into the game, and um, and there's some more competition in the software environment. So this pre-simulation of this metal print. Because my biggest pain in making a Binder Jet metal part was not knowing how it shrinks. Like a hole is maybe 6% smaller, the whole body maybe 1.5% smaller, and trying to design, especially when you're talking about uh, designing additive parts and compensating with CAD, uh, was uh, often unpredictable and rapid. It required many iterations. Um, metal deposition is also coming out, kind of the same with binder jet metal, where imagine a plasticized metal rod. So uh, think about a metal or a metal material with a small sphere of plastic around it uh, built into a rod form. And now I build the part like I do with fused deposition modeling. I then go take that, bake it out, and create my solid metal part. Again, desktop metals in the game. Mark Forge is in the game with that. I'm keeping my eye on that. And you may have some interesting abilities like creating more sparse infills, which you can't do with direct metal unless you have an exit area uh, for it. So uh, something to keep an eye on there. I've been uh, looking at uh, new powder bed fusion. So high-speed sintering uh, is still on the horizon. I'm waiting to see it, uh, but I, I'm keeping an eye out there, as well as new polymers, uh, you know, I'd love to see more uh, poly materials like polypropylene, polyethylene uh, coming out. Like, let's get away from nylon. I love nylon, but maybe uh, the polymer is, you know, something very specific to that laser centering platform. And I'm keeping my eye open for what's out there. Um, hybridization. Uh, so you may have seen in the news some hybrid machines, things that will metal deposit, like do direct energy deposition, kind of like a um, spray of metal with a laser fusing it on the spot, and then a post CNC mill all within that process. Um, some initial promis promising results, but it's not a plug and play activity yet. It's an engineering effort to make that happen, but more and more machines are becoming available and the software is catching up with that. If you didn't notice this already, software plays a huge role. A lot of these technologies are established and they're getting, um, they're getting better by the software that's included to it. So I can't stress enough software. Um, basically, the digital machine, pre-simulating how a build's going to turn out uh, before you build and making the corrections before you build it. It's something that we do every day when we talk about simulating uh, during CAD design or simulating machine tool paths. It's happening now in uh, um, uh, more than ever an additive, especially for correction before the failure happens. And uh, as always, I'm keeping my mind open for you know more pleasant surprises on the additive manufacturing landscape. Uh, if you guys hear of anything cool, shoot me a text as well because I'm interested in it. So to recap, again, we don't have we. It's, I could talk about this a whole week, uh, but uh, uh, I wanted to highlight what I use the most in applications, what I see the most uh, used as well uh, here at Zometry. And again, we offer uh, most of the technologies available for industrial additives. So it's a really good scope of the market there. Uh, but when you're doing metal 3D printing, uh, don't just take that CNC machine part and put it in the metal printer and say, let's just do it this way. It won't be cheaper. It'll be bulky and actually risky for the build. Make sure you're building on purpose. You're building parts on a diet. Give them a um, um, hollow them out, give them shells, give them ribs and other features. Uh, organic features are okay. Thumbs up for that. Build with purpose. It's great for low volume prototypes. It's great for a direct surrogate, surrogate or a direct replacement for casts. So die cast or investment cast. Um, even adding multiple parts together to create that complex all in one assembly. Perfect example used for uh, metal 3D printing there. Polymer 3D printing, of course, you do one offs, not just prototypes, but one offs. If you have a market of 12, you could actually make a part for that market of 12 with, uh, with 3D printing. Um, the smaller pieces uh, can scale to production. So DLS, rule of two fingers. SLS multi-jet, rule of the fist. Uh, FDM, rule of the arm. You know, these are, uh, these are design shapes and sizes that can scale decently well in those processes. Uh, and just understand that oftentimes you're moving to traditional processes your rev changes before your tooling changes uh, or your tooling expires. So with Polymer, you can work with high levels of configurations, so mass configurations, 
or in high iterations where your rev is changing. Um, uh, for specific uses, fixtures, very powerful. And for things like SLA, DLS, polyjet, uh, you can use for fit checks. So this final fit checks before moving to that traditional process. It's a, also a fantastic sanity check where you're moving, um, especially in a product development where you're investing tens of thousands of dollars to get to the next level. So why would I stick to it with traditional processes? Well, with traditional, the less work, the better. So if I have a chunky part or a larger part, uh, I, I'm actually milling that metal down less to get that feature. So that's usually a better candidate for traditional processes. If you already have a part characterized, it's been in your process for 20 plus years, it's probably best in that process because it's been optimized for that. Uh, but if you're move, moving to a new technology, you may want to start putting uh, additive as an option in your tool belt there. Um, critical surface requirements, tight tolerances, uh, stringent specifications, and material specifications. These are all still um, in development, and they're limited when it comes to additive compared to the the traditional CNC sheet metal and injection molded market. So sometimes just by the specifications alone, you have to stick with traditional processes. This is a huge barrier to entry, especially when you talk about um, aerospace and some medical device uh, manufacturing needs, because it's actually the uh, like the requirement or our checkbox, uh, the checkboxes that are needed that may say, hey, I actually have to move to injection mold because I need this specific material that's already been characterized and approved. Uh, 3D additive is getting there. More and more materials are getting approvals, getting certifications behind them. Uh, but just understand that sometimes that can be your, your limiting factor. Um, but understand that additive typically plays a role in any physical product development now. So whether it is that prototype, whether it is that one-off, whether that's part of your product, uh, it is something that I highly recommend if you're not using it in your physical product right now that you should take a look into that because it should be part of your product development cycle. It will help you save money, help you get a realistic snapshot. So um, before we go into some uh, additional resources and questions, um, I did want to show you some of Zometry's instant pricing platform. And this is also my obligatory plug saying like, uh, um, for anybody who's on this web webinar today, uh, if you do go onto Zometry and make a quote this afternoon, I'll send you a T-shirt. Uh, so I got I got your I got your names here, and I uh, I'd love to send you a T-shirt. Love you to check out the platform. I'm just gonna I'm gonna shut my mouth for a second here, and we're gonna. With the Zometry Instant Quoting Engine, it's incredibly easy to get a quote in multiple processes, from CNC to 3D printing, sheet metal to urethane casting. In just a few clicks, you can get a quote and purchase your parts. Upload your 3D models to get started. Our quoting engine instantly analyzes the geometry and properties and returns cost, lead time, and manufacturability feedback. We auto-quoted this part in SLS nylon with a standard finish. Easily adjust the process, material, and finish with our intuitive searchable dropdowns. Now we'll quote this part in CNC aluminum 6061 with a black anodized finish we can instantly review the updated price. Scroll down to specify additional requirements and add a drawing, if applicable. Easily upload revisions based on design feedback, drag more parts into your quote, and modify multiple parts using the bulk modify function. With many of our processes, you have the option to choose from expedite, standard, or economy rates. You can even specify certifications needed. When you're ready to place an order, click continue to check out. That's it. No more waiting around for quotes to come back. And if you have any questions, just ask. Zometry is your one-stop shop for manufacturing on demand. Upload your 3D models and get started. All right, so yeah, that was... Uh... That was me talking, so it's very meta here. Uh, but yeah, I just uh, I just wanted to show you because that that's a real time quote. It is super fast. It's instantaneous to price out and even compare, saying like, "Hey, I have this design. Will it be good for at quantity four for DMLS or for CNC machining?" 
you can click drag upload and kind of click between these options and you can see how those prices scale over quantity um, and including your spec needs as well. So it's just very useful uh, to use it, not just as a, hey, I need to buy a part right now, but as a tool, especially when you're prototyping price. Uh, we even have add-ins for SolidWorks and Inventor. Uh, so you can actually do that pricing and that configuration right in your platform. So you, if you go to Zometry, the website, click on uh, um, resources and add-ins, you can download those and install those. Um, but yeah, we, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, additive is just you know part of what we do, and that's why I have this very agnostic approach for manufacturing. Now, I'm more interested in you know what do the next six weeks look like for you, what do the next six months look like for you, and what do the next six years look like for you in your product development process? Because oftentimes those are different stages of manufacturing that I may help suggest uh, and, and work through with you, as well as our expert team here at Zometry. Um, the other thing to note is that Zometry, we are backed by a massive manufacturing partner network. We have over 3,000 manufacturers uh, that are in CNC sheet as well as additive manufacturing injection molding. So uh, when a job is ordered on Zometry.com, uh, we take a quick look for things like DFM and any feedback, and then we actually pair that work with those manufacturers that are best able to make it. So this is a vetted manufacturing network. Uh, across our platform, they're actually using uh, Zometry's site uh, to uh, take and fulfill orders through. And uh, we are using the most qualified manufacturers to hit specific needs, including things like, you know, a prototype's one thing, but if you have something that is, for example, ITAR export controlled aerospace, uh, we can actually pair that with the right shops with the right capabilities to make sure that job is done to spec and on time. We even offer things like inspection reports, CMM, all that is selectable. Um, so uh, we have a lot of customers. Uh, we are a manufacturing leader across many industries. Uh, a lot of times engineers find us and the procurement loves us because of that, all those technologies under one roof and that uh, that ability to just do instant quoting for that. So just something to, to keep in mind is that you know, we become a very powerful tool for procurement. Uh, I also, I do a lot of videos, informative videos. Uh, sometimes these, are, these ones are more fun, like uh, just putting uh, some 3D printed materials to the test, but also things like common questions, surface finishes, uh, why would I choose FDM over SLS? I have a lot of uh, videos on our site that you could check out. Um, uh, we do design guides for every single process that we offer. And we also love highlighting our customers through case studies. So if you do, if you are a Zometry customer and you have a cool project you wanna highlight, please reach out to me. I'll make sure to get you in the right hands. We love telling customer stories. Um, we have uh, live support, uh, 8 to nine, eight a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time via email, live chat on the site or phone. And I'm trying to, and uh, yeah, just uh, if, you, um, if you know someone who may be interested in our services, we also have a referral program. So zometry.com forward slash refer uh, gives you details there. But I think uh, I want to start answering some questions here. So yeah, thank you all for tuning into the presentation. And Carlos, yeah, let's uh, let's get cracking on some questions. Sure thing. Thank you very much, Greg. A few of you have already submitted questions. And if you'd like to submit a question, type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the Submit button. During the Q&A, please complete the feedback form, which is located on the bottom of your screen. Our first question is, can 3D printing make parts with two or more materials? So. Yes, uh, but mostly that's around photopolymers. So there's a process called polyjet, uh, which is a thing about a stereolithography where I'm taking a liquid resin bath and then curing that with a, uh, with a laser or a DLP camera, only turn that upside down and make it like an inkjet printer, where instead I'm moving back and forth and doing micro droplets of a liquid resin, and then I'm taking a lamp and kind of curing it along the pathway. Because I'm doing micro drops like an inkjet, just like you see, you know, color ink, uh, you know, paper. Uh, the same thing you can do with digital properties of materials. So you can combine different materials together to give these different digital properties. The one thing to say is that any of these things like polyjet, uh, when you're doing multi materials, just understand it's all engineering feels like materials because these photopolymers all inherently can brittle over time. And for example, a rubber like. Uh, material, say so you're doing it for a rubber to touch gasket or a rubber to touch overmold. Um, it's really good for that durometer squish. So I can simulate like short A27 up to short A95, but it may not be good for like the stretchiness, the elasticity. 
and that's where I may look at something like uh, Arts Carbon DLS, uh, Elastiverse, like that SIL or that EPU uh, to do that. So sometimes, like sometimes it's very good. Like I'm doing a toothbrush handle, and I want to make sure like it fits and feels uh, with that uh, nice little overmold feel to it. Uh, where sometimes, uh, if you need something that's going to be like really taking a beating, I may actually do a hybrid and kind of glue bond those together. Where I may use like EPU to make that. Uh, um, the rubber-like material, and then I may use a rigid thermoplastic 3D printing process and bond those together. Next question. Can additive manufacturing create a part that is stronger than compared to traditional manufacturing? Uh, so that's where design freedom comes in the mind. Uh, understand that these materials, I mean, inherently are solid. So, and the materials are materials. Like, so I can have, for example, a carbon e or RPU is going to actually have better mechanical behavior than ABS plastic, just because inherently it has, you know, better tensile strength and impact re uh, resilience to it. But I, I always tell our customers, like, uh, there's there's a reason why I can cut a steak with a plastic knife. It's not because that plastic is the you know king there. It's actually because the design is there. The design is giving that knife that knife kind of a T-shaped cross section to it with self-reinforcing ribs, uh, and there's design intent put into that to give it strength. So just understand that what additive can introduce to you is the ability to put more functional design intent uh, directly into the part geometry than what may be limited by uh, traditional manufacturing, where you have to th think about access. Can I get my tool head down there to make that feature? Or can I open and shut my mold to create that feature? Um, in additive, I have more freedom to give myself like things like cross posts, ribs, and even lattice structures. Thank you. Our next question is, what is the cost effectiveness of additive manufacturing when compared to CNC and metal additive manufacturing? Yeah, so that scalability is going to come to the setup uh, required, right, in, in the geometry. So let's say, you know, apples to apples, I'm working on a small piece. Uh, and actually, we just, uh, um, I did a blog post maybe a month ago on this kind of showing the cost comparison where I have a, I have a large piece and with setups and, and everything, like additive wins for like the first five, and then all of a sudden that amortization over time, uh, traditional processes start to start to wit off on that uh, because additive kind of stagnated where I could only fit so much in one build. But say I had a piece like a thimble, like or you know this is probably well, this is probably the extreme case, but like I have a small mechanical piece. I can often build like a thousand, two thousand in a process like SLS or HP Multijet Fusion before I start getting into the competitiveness where I may have to buy a tool up front and then amortize that tool via injection molding. So it's very geometry depend dependent. And those rules that I mentioned there, so like the two finger rule for carbon, the rule of the fist for, for SLS and kind of like the rule of the forearm for, for FDM are gonna help show you some scalability uh, depending on the platform uh, and some rules of thumbs. Uh, other thing I recommend again is on our website, if you upload a part for quote, uh, you can go and uh, change materials process and change quantities and see how those scale on the fly. Because as I mentioned, sometimes additive wins at quantity one, um, but another technology may overcome as the quantities uh, increase because all of a sudden that setup becomes less and less important. Our next question is, what are the tolerance and metal strength duplication capabilities of current metal 3D printers? So tolerances typically are plus or minus five uh, thousand thousand inch. So it has typical CNC tolerances, but understand that the outer surface, that kind of matte uh, surface of it, it's a, it has a very different physical property than uh, something that's about you know 0. 0.6 millimeters deep on that that part. So interior to that part, you have strength that is usually um, higher than cast, but maybe a little weaker than billet. And then depending on what type of post-thermal treatment I'm doing, I could even get better properties from that metal. But uh, the outer um, the outer layer of it, so say I have a very thin feature, it's going to behave differently than the salt, like a solid milled metal at a thin feature because of that kind of initial roughness. So there's almost like, I don't want to call it porousness because it's not the right phrase, but just understand that the material Ha, it like has like little grooves, like dents and valleys in that in that outer surface, especially the outer outer half millimeter, and that's kind of the world of weird when it comes to metal additive. 
Um, sometimes if you're doing post machining, you're going to actually add about 30 thousandths offset to a feature that you're going to machine and then machine that off so you get that, that nice smooth billet finish. Thank you. We have time for one more question before we have to wrap mm -hmm. up. Which manufacturing process is better, SLA or SLS? Ooh, all right. Um, so SLA tends to have a little bit higher price per part, but it is smoother. And SLA offers engineer materials. So Zometry, I think we have nine, or we have 15 SLA options. Nine of them have the option for standard and, or HD resolution. Typically, smaller feature detail size and smooth finish. If you say that, I'm probably going to point you right towards SLA because that's going to be that is probably the make it or break it need for you. Um, SLS is decent in de detail level, but that small stuff uh, it just can't get as detailed as SLA. And the two CAD accuracy, especially when it gets small, starts to kind of get a little bit fuzzy down there. So I always joke like if you say you have a 0 .6, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2 millimeter wall. Um, in SLS, it'll be a 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5 millimeter wall because sir, there's just basically so much a laser can do, uh, and, and you get that thermal bleed going through. Um, but SLS is robust. So say I, this, that same part, apples, apples, but the most important thing for you is I need to be able to drop it and not worry about it uh, breaking, or what I call the CEO test, which is can I hand it to my CEO without him breaking it instantly, him or her? And... Uh, and then you may want to use something like a thermoplastic like SLS or multi jet fusion because that stuff is tough. Um, I used to use it for ruggedized military platforms, so uh, it can take a beating. Well, thank you very much, Greg. That's all about that's about all the time we have today. There were several questions that we couldn't get to, so you oh, yeah. may receive an email response from Greg afterwards. I'd like to thank yeah, all of you for I, joining us. Oh, I'm sorry, Greg. Oh, I was going to say, I'm just I scrolling through. I have, I'll, I'll be able to answer all these questions. I did have some questions about the T-shirt. Um, so since you are registered for this uh, uh, webinar, um, please go up, uh, please go and make a quote. What we're going to be looking for is just uh, the, um, the email correlation, and I'll, I'll you know, just stick the marketing team on it, and we'll, re we'll reach out to you. Um, but yeah, definitely give a, give a quote, and that's uh, something today. So if uh, uh, give us a try, and that's, that's how you get it. I saw about three questions. It was just like, tell me about that T-shirt again. So that's how I get it. <laughs> no problem. Well, I'd like to thank everyone that's on the call for joining us. We hope that this webinar was valuable to you. A special thanks to Greg for his time and his insights. Mm -hmm. Remember to take our short survey, which is available on the menu doc, and we'll also open a new window on your screen momentarily. Your feedback is important to us. If you missed any part of the presentation, it will be archived shortly so you can view it again. Refer to someone to it or access those related materials yourself. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Guys, thank you so much. It was a pleasure.